Hello everyone, welcome to What If Issei Becomes the True Dragon of Rhea's Gremory Season 1 Part 4. Before we start please go support Marcus BM 2005 for writing that awesome fanfic, now let's begin. Chapter 11. Revelation. Gremory Territory. Inside the bedroom of Rhea's Gremory, the head of the Gremory clan and Archduchess of Gremory, three people are standing around her bed. They are Kiba, Gaspar and Roswis, all of whom are very worried about their kings and best friends, well-being, as Rhea's has been like this for the last four hours. And they all knew why, which almost made the current mood even worse in Hall Mansion, as no one, but the servants, had not been affected by this. The room was silent, only the low breaths of everyone could be heard, while a few times footsteps could be heard outside. Gaspar sat on a chair next to Rhea's bed, holding her hand, and by what Kiba and Roswis could geese, praying to the spirit of Issei to help Rhea's feel better. Kiba had thought about doing the same, but he would just feel bad for calling on Issei's help, as it would make him feel useless, and that he couldn't do anything without Issei which he sometimes felt like were true. Ross was switch her focus a few times over the last few hours, as she was asked by a cone to be in charge until she came back, or if Rias woke up. She had been taking a few calls, silently of course, and received a few messages. One of these messages, which had been sent only a few minutes ago, was from LaFay. And it had something very interesting in it, as Roswis had been looking at it for the last five minutes, reading it through all the way to make sure she wasn't being fooled. Gibba. Gasper come see. This she spoke with a shaky voice as the two males looked over at her, seeing how her face had a rather shocked face on it, Kiba was the first to walk over and see what she was looking at. Gasper followed slowly after, as his legs were a bit weak after sitting on a chair for the last four hours. Roswis made the messages bigger and turned it towards them, they both looked confused at it. What does LaFay want? Asked Kiba, his voice seemed uninterested, until he saw it. Dear Rhea's Gremory, I have wonderful news that I and the rest of Team Volley would love to share, but can't as per the recusant of Lord Serzich's Lucifer. But since they decided to leave without me, I have put it upon myself to inform you that early totted Albion had sensed the angry of Issei Haidu. In other words we theories that he was still alive, which the rest of Team now has found was indeed true. He is alive somewhere in the familiar forest. Lefay the message had made all three of them stunned by this. Roswis who had already read it and regained a bit more of her compressor, now stood and looked at the two boys in front of her. Kiba had a happy look to him, though it turned rather quickly into a confused and shameful one. Will Gasper was just crying in every emotion that would fit his current mental state. Though something that Roswis also saw, as she was trying to come up with a plan to deal with this, was that Rhea's bed was empty. She was gone. Where is Rhea's? Asked Roswis, making the two boys come half out of their sadness state, they both looked towards the bed and saw the same. An empty bed. They all three looked at each other unsure of what to do. That was until Roswis got a small idea of where she might be. I think she might have seen the message from LaFay, so she must be in the familiar forest, we need to go there now ordered Roswis, the two boys nodding in agreement. Familiar forest, have you sensed anything since we came here, Albion? Asked Vali as he, and his team plus Serzich's and Grafia, had arrived in the familiar forest. They had began search for his angry or anything they could use to find him. No, nothing no wait I have something. To the north over at that mansion, I feel his angry. But be warned it is not the only dragonic one I can sense from there. Spoke Albion as the others looked towards the mansion, now sensing it too. Four or five dragonic signatures in one area, and all of them were strong. It didn't help much when they sensed the four devils among the dragon ones. But they also sense a few more devil energies in the area, a group around the same size as them heading towards them and one other, who seemed to be rushing towards the mansion. Both Serzich's and Grafia felt sad angry, and for a brief moment felt like they had to run after them, but they didn't know why. It seems that Karuka's little sister Peerage are on their way here, maybe to fetch us or something like that. Said Albion, who too had felt that other devil angry, but didn't focus too much on it. As he had said earlier, Kaneko's Peerage came up to them, after having spotted them a bit further down the road. My king, me and the rest of our master's Peerage, has been sent here to fetch you, as per both our master and lady teammates orders. Spoke Neen, the queen of Kaneko bowing before Serzich's as did the rest of the peerage with her. Thank you, I would like to make ideal chat, but that can wait. Is Issei with TM8? Asked Serzich's as he began to walk towards the mansion with the others following suit, he was worried, but wouldn't show it. Though Grafia knew, as he would always stand around and make ideal chat whenever he dealt with a problem of little importance. Yes my king, we ourselves don't who this person is, at least not enough to know how or why Amai would come all the way here spoke Nina as she followed nervously behind Serzich's. Nor would you, thanks to those old fools. He is important, very important. That should be enough for now. Said Serzich's, a bit more friendliness coming forward as he felt the poor girl trying her best not to stumble her thanks to how nervous she was. Karuka suddenly grabbed the now much calmer Nina on her left shoulder, making her now slightly shocked at the sudden contact. Is my sister okay? 
is she? Asked Karuka, her tone letting her worries be heard. Neen looked puzzled, as she wasn't quite sure how to answer that. She would like to think that she is okay or at least safe, but she couldn't be quite sure after all that has happened. She hasn't seen her since she went inside the cave with Tiamate and Issei. I don't know, but I believe she is safe as Lady Zenobia and Asia are there with her. Neen tried to hide her own doubt, but felt the piercing glare of worried big sister, slowly crawling through her words and then. Good, thank the mass. Spoke Karuka with real life, making Neen also sigh in real life. I'll be going on ahead of you, this is gonna take too long. Said Vali as he suddenly summoned his sliver wings and flew towards the mansion, followed a bit after by Bikuo, who was a bit interested to see who these dragons were, along with seeing Issei for the first in a decade. Even if he don't want to admit it, he has missed him a lot. Spoke Arthur with little emotion in his voice, but a friendly smile and clear blue eyes looking towards the silhouettes of Vali and Biku. He is right that going by foot will take longer, but I can't make myself go to him any faster. Said Serzichas as he kept walking forwards not even looking towards the others as he said that, but more to himself. Grafia knew why, as he had told her that he felt that it was his fault that Issei died, if only his plan had worked, then he would have still been around. She held a small smile as her husband continued to doubt himself over something she and he knew Issei would never hold him up to, that is just not the person he is. Or ever would be. Inside Tiamate's cave, Tiamate, Lilith, Zenobia and Kaneko had been talking a bit to help Tiamate not feel too worried about Issei, her son's incredible power. She could still barely understand how he had been allowed to keep or gain such tremendous power as only 11 years old hatchling. Zenobia and Kaneko had just kept saying that he was called the Red Dragon Emperor of the Impossible for a reason. She had laughed at these comments, but still her worries lingered, and even more so her own selfish one. Would he leave me, now that he is stronger and knows about his past? Will he ever look at me the same way? She wondered, she feared, she dreaded. She felt two people exist the dome around to say that Great Red had created, to keep his power, his aura from destroying the cave. Out came Akon and Asia, both smiling widely. Akon seemed to be a bit more sad, but even then her smile was radiant. While Asia seemed to have had a much more pleasant experience compared to what she had heard from the two others. Kaneko stood up, along with Zenobia and walked over to the two. They made a group hug as they all smiled, speaking in a low tone. Though thanks to the fact all the people who weren't in the hug were dragons, they could hear every word they said. How did it go, Asia? Did you meet him as well? Asked Kaneko, as Asia nodded happily, tears stringing down her face. Yes, I did. It makes me miss him even more. She stopped as she looked down for a bit, the others understanding why, only for her to look up again with almost even brighter smile. But I saw Issei in his human form, I think. He was so cute and he called me one Isan. She said as her tears rolled down from her eyes, her smile ever bright. The other girls were shocked to hear about his human form, as was Tiamate. The cone smirked a bit at this, as her inner competitive self came out. Oh. Well I met mine and Issei daughter, I even got a kiss from him as he was my husband. She said with pride, the other otter, then turning to female aggression as she had called him her husband. What do you mean your husband, he is mine started Asia. No I believe I should have him as my husband, as I found him. Followed by Kaneko. No I believe the real essay was trying to tell me, he wants to marry me and only me, he. Said a cone with playful smirk. Will Zenovia was confused over why they fighting over who gets him as their husband, when it was obviously her he would marry. The four dragons let them play their little game, as it was better than them crying over having seen him. Though Tiamate and Lilith would listen in every time something interesting was said. So you spoke to him? What did he say? Asked Office as she gained the focus of every dragon in the cave. Great Red looked at her, then back to the sleeping body of Issei, then back to her. At once this thing that all of his former loves are doing is over, then I will come and take his soul into a dream of his own. Where he will dream forever, until my own demise said Great Red, as the three females looked at him with a bit of shock in their eyes. So you will grant him his own heaven of sorts. Interesting, why did I never think of that? Can I offer my own instead? Asked Office, getting a no signal from Great Red as soon as her words had left her mouth. No, as I don't think here you would like that happen. Imogen being in limbo is your heaven. Sounds awful, so that is why I am taking him into my very being as part of the endless dream. Spoke Great Red, gained a small pout from Office who kinda wanted to let find peace in her own being and a thankful smile from Tiamate. Great Red and Office turned their heads towards the entrance, followed by the two other dragons. It seems like people just won't stop bothering me today. Said Tiamate as she began to walk over towards the entrance, followed Lilith and Office. As they knew the person and wanted to see what he was doing here. Great Red stayed behind, to keep an eye on Issei. I wonder if he knows that I can sense if he is sleeping or not. Wondered Great Red, as he saw Issei open his left slightly only to close it again. Much like a person waking up over a long period of time. 
He chuckled a bit to himself, as he always found it amusing to see how beings of different races and standing in this world act. Oh mortals, the funniest creatures, only followed by gods and office at how laughable they are. He thought as continued to look around the cave, seeing with his dreamlike abilities what this place has seen throughout the years. A mortherly teammate playing with her first and only hatchling, and Issei learning and growing up as a dragon. As Great Red continued to see what has been, he was interrupted when he sensed a rather destructive presence coming closer to the cave. He looked shocked for a few seconds, then confused as the presence suddenly advanced into the thin air. He tried to sense for it, but it seemed like his sense were being interrupted or cut off in some way. He didn't fully understand what was happening. What could be strong enough to cut off his sense or magical sense in this situation? He kept at it, feeling the presence a few times, it was coming closer. He looked over towards the sleeping body of Issei, noticing he seemed to be reacting to something as well. Could he be sensing this as well? He though, but when he looked at the four devil females left in the room with room he was confused, as they didn't seem to have sensed anything at all. He began walking slowly over to Issei body, as he felt like whatever this presence was, it was after Issei for some reason. The girls noticed this, and looked at him worried. The cone stood up and walked slowly towards him, with the other girls following behind her. He was still too focused on the weird presence that he wasn't prepared for the sudden feeling of a hand on his shoulder. What he yelled, not really caring as he was still trying to find or at least keep track of this presence. I am sorry. But you. Oh uh, you seem a bit stressed or. Or worried perhaps. Can we do anything? To uh. Uh to help. Ask a cone, who would have enjoyed the sudden egregion at any other moment, but not right now as he looked as serious to have just yelled for no reason. I keep feeling this weird presence near us, but I can't seem to track it down or anything other than where it is with second between. It keeps cutting off my scent somehow, leaving me blind. If you four can also try to sense it, that would hopefully tell me what it is after. He explained, the four devils nodded and began to do the same as he was doing. But they didn't feel or find anything weird after a solid minute of trying. We can't find anything, maybe it's just too strong for us said Kaneko, making great red growl as it seemed like this presence was so strong that only he or maybe even Office could sense them or keep sensing them over and over again. Speaking of which, he felt Office entering the room again. Along with the teammate, Lilith and the host of Albion and the new son Wukong. He turned his head, seeing the, the shocked faces of Vali and Bhikkhu as they saw his save body or rather his new body. But he didn't care about that, but more the two people he believed could help him with this current problem he was dealing with. Office, Albion come help me. You must both have sensed this weird presence right. He asked as Office nodded as she had, but felt that Great Red might already be dealing with it. Two sliver wings popped out of Volley's back, as a booming voice was heard from them. What presence might you be talking about? I have only felt. Oh I see. Albion had just noticed as he had sense for whatever Great Red had talked about, and just sensed Great Red senses being cut off again. Help will you? I fear this thing might be after a say for whatever reason. Great Red spoke as he focused his full power into to finding this weird presence, he was joined by Office and Albion Volley a bit after. Can you sense anything Albion? I can having it be cut off as I feel the slightest bit of it asked Volley, as Albion knew what he meant, as it was more or less the same for him. No not really either, I am having the same problem as you Volley. Whoever or whatever this thing is, it is clearly powerful if only Great Red and Office can sense it as well as they can. Spoke Albion groining a bit at his failure to sense anything today, as well as he would normally. I bell of you are right with its current goal, as it seems to be sensing for Issei. You can feel that destructive aura flooding over Issei, right? Ask Office as Great Red nodded in agreement. The other people in the cave looked at Issei body and noticed this weird and grimson red aura flooding over it. It began to spread it out as if warding off those near his body. It clicked for the four devils, this magic or aura rather was Rhea's Gremory's aura. It's Rhea's, she is awake dot dot, but what is she doing here? Asked a cone in low voice, but it heard by every dragon in the room. Rias? What is she doing here, I though Serzichas wouldn't tell you her until we found Issei. Jeez. Vali said as the current situation seemed to be getting a bit more problematic than he had first expected. He turned towards the rest of the group as he got eye contact with them all. Me, Biku and you guys will go out and find her, hopefully we can calm her down. Or else we'll have another cow town incident on our hands. He said, the last part a bit lower, as to not bring back bad memories to the girls. But Kaneko heard it, her mind went blank at the mention of it. No need, she is already here. Said Great Red, and as if on K. The cave walls behind Issei blew up, throwing dust and stone and rocks of all types at the people inside the cave. The three dragon gods just took it, Tiamat trying not to cough too much stod near them as well, her motherly instinct, telling her run to her hatchling side and protect him. The others had to wave their hands around. Bali used a small wind spell making all the dust leave the room. It all went right the new hole in the cave, letting everyone in it see the looming figure of Rhea's Gremory. 
her entire body was covered in a thin layer of destructive magic, not as strong or as dense as Serzich's, when he would go into his super devil form, but quit close to it. It was leaking from her though, mostly from her legs and feet. It seemed to almost flood the whole floor as it kept spreading out. It didn't hurt though, but it was still unnerving that she could pull off something like this. If she decided to make all of it into destruction magic, then they would all be dead. Or very hurt in a few cases. Bali tried to take a step forward, but was stopped by a cone who shakingly walked forward, followed by her friends. Rias hadn't seen them or was just ignoring them completely, as she seemed to be scanning the cave for something or someone. Rias. What are you doing here? Asked a cone, her voice was a bit weak, but still strong enough to make Rias look at her. I am here to see my essay. Where is my essay? She asked, her voice was cold and uncaring towards her, she just wanted to find her essay. He is right. There a cone spoke weakly, while she pointed a finger towards the sleeping body of Issei. Rias followed her finger point of derocation, her eyes growing wide as she saw the sleeping body of a red dragon. She turned her head back towards a cone and the others. That thing is not my Issei, where is he? She yelled coursing the cave to shack a bit, as her aura for a spilt second grew more intense, it even hurt the people in the room for a quick second. The cone winced in pain, as she felt some of her skin had burned off. She looked back at Rias who looked at her with sad eyes. She knew that if Rias got more angry than she and the others would have stop her, or she might kill some of the people in this cave, without a single thought. I know it sounds insane, but trust me Rias. That dragon is a say. She spoke as she tried to look brave, mostly to make her three friends next to her, not be too scared. But she was scared, very very scared. She had seen what could happen if Rias went further than this, she had seen it once. The aura grew a slight bit more intense, not hurting anyone yet, but it didn't help the people in this room to not feel a bit of dread. Expect office, Lilith and Great Red. Rias looked sternly at Issei, scanning every bit of his body, and after a few seconds, her eyes widened as she felt it. It was his aura. She felt onto her knees, as she shakingly looked towards a cone, her eyes asking if it was really him. A cone nodded slowly, hoping. No praying to whatever power that she wouldn't go berserk and destroy everything. She looked back to his body, her eyes was filled with tears within seconds. My Issei. He is right here she whispered, almost mumbled. No one moved as everyone in the cave had they full attention on Rias, checking to her aura for any sudden spikes in power or interest. After a bit, Tiamate decided to go over to her son. Great Red would have stopped her, if not for office graping his hand, telling him with no words. She is his mother and she wants her hatchling to be safe. Let's just watch for now. Great Red nodded, as they both stood and kept a trained eye on her. As Tiamate got closer to say, Rias had still not reacted to her presences, letting her kneel down next to his head. She struck it softly, not fully sure about what she was supposed to do. Rias had still not moved her gaze from Issei's head, but her eyesight of Issei became block as the hand of a beautiful woman struck Issei's head. She looked up at her face, seeing a truly stunning woman. But Rias didn't care about that, more that she was touching her Issei. She stood up slowly, taking one step at a time towards her, whom kept looking at Issei. Tiamate's instinct screamed at her that something dangerous was coming towards, but she didn't listen as her motherly instinct told her to keep her hatchling, her red gem company, and to stay close. Rhea stood a few feet away from the two, her aura still seemed calm, but the killing intent was all tonauticable. Especial to the dragons in the room. Tiamate turned her head so that her eyes could meet Rhea's. She got eye contact, but Rhea's eyes were not a real eye color, but rather a blood red color. It sent a shiver down Tiamate's spine, as Rhea's eyes seemed to piece her her own eyes, know her very soul almost. Why? Are. You. Touching. My say. Rhea's yelled her aura failuring as she yelled, sending the unprepared Tiamate flying along with a few of the other, weaker, people in the room. The is mine no one will take him or touch, but me she yelled, another wave of destructive magic was sent out, making the cave shack violently again. Both Office and Great Red looked on, with a rather calm expression as they were both more observing than anything else at this point. Rias had noticed that and looked at them in full anger, as her aura kept fouling out in rapid succession. And who are you two? She asked angrily as they didn't look like they care much, even though they did, they just knew it was not a good idea to become a part of this problem, not yet at least. Great Red huff a bit, as Rias in turn become more anionid. What's so funny? I will kill you she yelled, her mind had at this point already gone off, and now she was running on emotions. Not a good combination. Oh sorry devil girl, but I think you should apologize to Tiamate or her hatchling might just kill you without knowing who you are. Great red as he pointed behind Rias, who followed the derocation to find Issei standing up checking on his mother, in less of an intling state than he had shown early this day, but more animal-like. As he notched his snout against his mother's unconscious body. Issei. She spoke softly, a small smile creeping up on her face, happy to see him awake. She walked towards him slowly, her aura having died down a bit, not understanding the gravity of her current actions. 
is say it's me, Rias. She said softly as she continued moving closer to him, he in turn stopped his current movements as he turned his head towards her slowly. She had exited him to have happy looking eyes, but no. His eyes were narrowed as the golden light in them began to hurt just by them having eye contact. So, do you think she will survive? Asked Office to Great Red, he shook his head. I don't think so, unless we stop him that is. He answered. I say it's me, Rias. Your first kiss, your first everything. You must remember or at least know me right. She asked not sensing the dangerous amount of hatred and killing intent leaking from his body. But when she had said her name, he reacted. A small pain began to form, first in his head, then his stomach as he felt his skin began to become solid. He began growl in both pain and anger, Rhea saw this and became worried. I say are you okay? What's wrong? She asked, only to now notice the metallic plates forming around his body as it began to reform something around his body. She had hoped to never see again. He roared with so much power even Great Red and Office felt it and was pushed a bit back. His body began to moff even more as he began to grow golden gym different places all over his body. Rias took a step back as she almost fell on her back by the sheer fear she had begun to feel. The. Juggernaut drive. Volley said as he sat on the ground looking at it in pure shock, much like the others would kneezing this. I am the abandoned host of dragons sounded the voice of Issei, the old Issei, but his voice was deep and looming to hear Dodd I was lost in a mist of nothing, with only a shell to call myself he continued, Rias stared at him with eyes of pure fear. The others in the room, exited the dragon gods and Tiamat, began to slowly retread away from him as the power he was sending out was on a whole other level than what they could handle. I had it all, only to lose it all you. I am blind to the infinite and have forgotten the dream for every new line, his power and body grew. They knew that by the next line, he would destroy this world. I will take you to the forgotten and let you sleep in the pit of no memory. The next line couldn't any of the people wait for as they all ran as fast as they could. Leaving only Office, Great Red, Lilith, Rias and Tiamat to take on his wrath face first. The three dragon gods use magic to not only shield themselves but also teleport Tiamat and Rias out of the cave as Issei was finally done with his chant. I am Issei Haidu, the dragon everyone forgot forgotten juggernaut drive and expulsion envolpeded the whole cave in a bright crimson red light. Chapter 12. Heavenly Wrath, Familiar Forcet, Serzich's, Grafia and Team Volley, Expect Volley, Biku and Lafay, plus Kaneko Peerage, had all run towards the mansion as a huge amount of demonic magic had begun to spike from there. But before they could get any close, suddenly they saw six people running out of the cave, then a second later two other people teleported right next to Serzich's. Then he felt the sudden dragonic angry rising from inside the cave, he knew the angry, the aura it was Issei's. It's his. It's Issei's, just like back when. It dawned on him as he felt the angry was about to burst. Brafia magic shields now Serzich's yelled as he began to pour as much magic he could into a magical shield he had summoned. Grafia followed his lead as fast as she could, the six people reached them just as it happened. Serzich's and Grafia weren't prepared for how strong the burst of angry was going to be, but their shields held on, just barely. The game could smoke rose from the mansion as it hid the entire thing in it. Serzich's looked at the eight new people and saw his sister was here. He kneeled down to her side as fast as he could. She opened her eyes as she saw her older brother, holding her hand with worry in his eyes. Oni-chan. Where am I? She asked as her mind had seemed to finally come down and her thoughts had become much clearer, but still not clear enough what she had done after she woke up. You're in the familiar forest. But why are you here? Last I heard you had fallen on Konkus and was lying in bed. He asked as she seemed to try and remember what had happened but couldn't remember anything. Serzich's looked at the other person who Grafia had taken care of instead. My lord, it appears this woman is Lady Tiamat. She is currently unconscious. Said Grafia when suddenly they both heard a hard slap right next to Serzich's. He turned his head to the sound and found a cone on her knees and her hand raised. He also noticed the newly made red mark on Rhea's cheek as she herself looked clueless as to why she had just been slapped. A cone. What's wrong she was stopped as Vali spoke for a cone. You hit a same mother, you jealous idoid answered Vali, a cone nodding with his statement. Both Serzich's and Rias looked confused at Vali, then to a cone. Will Grafia seemed to have put the pieces in places much quicker as she had noticed the aura around Tiamat was much like her own when Milicus had almost been killed. Rias' eyes began to widen when began to remember what she had done. I hid. Tiamat. Issei's mother is Tiamat. She looked weakly at the two people in front of her. Both a cone and Bali nodded, in turn making Rias feel her heart beat fast, almost too fast as her mind began to stop working. Serzich has also realized how bad the current situation now had become. I. He is going. To kill me my assay will. He'll kill me. Said Rias as breath became ragged as her body began shaking from how scared, sad and horrified she had become. 
A cone wanted to hug her, but her body, along with the others, all froze as they felt a powerful glare on them. Bali, Serzichas and Grafia looked towards the glare's directions, seeing the massive flying form of a dragon, a Visay. But something was wrong with his body, it didn't look like a normal dragon's, but more like the juggernaut drive. Said Great Red as he, Lilith and Ophis came walking out of the smoke where the cave used to be. They all looked towards the three, as they came to a stop in front of Rias and Serzichas, Ophis sat down next to them. Rias and Ophis' eyes met, as they looked at each other. I won't lie, you might die devil girl. She just said as if she was surpassed to understand it, but it clicked for her as Great Red made it easier to understand. What Office was trying to say, is that Issei will try to kill you, you already know why right? He asked, receiving a slow and scared nod. Good, at least you know your mistake, but now you will have to fix it. He said as Rias and the other's devils looked at him confused. How? Am I surpassed? To fix it? I hit teammate, I hit his mother. No child would forgive you. If you did something like that. Answer Rias, the other devils agreeing, as they had the same cusetion. Children are very attached to their parents, mostly their mothers, and they get very angry when bad things happens to them. Even more so when they are a dragon. True, normally a child wouldn't, but Issei is your normal child or hatchling in this case. He is a dragon of Dragon King power, more than his mother, which makes him a pot only new heavenly dragon. If you don't fix this problem, then I think you know what will happen. Dragons are known to hold grudges, it's something their pride demands. Explained Great Red as Rias listened to his explanations and thinking of a way to fix this, but it seemed almost impossible to her. But then something else popped into her train of thought. What would happen if I failed to earn his fortiveness? Well you would die and I would have to kill him or seal him away like other dragons before him. Answered Great Red as Rias' eyes widened in shock at having her mind readen like an open book. Don't worry, I bell of you can do it. Dragons are not beast, we are noble creatures, but our pride is our worst flaw. Explained Great Red, as held a hand out to her. She looked at it carefully, then reached her own out and put it in his. He stood up, helping her as well. The others looked on, not too sure what to do, not even Serzich's. He was worried, but felt that this person knew what he was doing. The two of them walked away from the group and near the smoke and dust as Great Red stopped and let go of her hand. She looked at him confused as to what she was surpassed to do now. I can't go with you further than this, as that would not teach you anything, and would be an insult to the angry hatchling waiting inside, who recusated this of me. Said Great Red in an stoic tone, making Rhea's gulp as she looked back towards the wall of dust, feeling the glare of Issei looking at her and only her. She hesitated a bit, then brought on her bravest face she could muster, as she took her first step inside the dust. As she kept taking short and slow steps she felt her vision fading slowly, as outside sounds also became mute. She could only see grey, light brown and sometimes black dust and smoke around her. She couldn't help but feel like she had just signed her own death sentence, but a small hope inside her told her to keep going. For a say, I must earn his forgiveness. Only then can we be taught through again. Hopefully. She thought as she kept walking forward, then suddenly she left the dust and smoke behind and entered a cave of some kind. She looked back at the dust behind her, only to find it to be gone and replaced by a solid wall of rock and stones. She looked back towards the way forward and knew it was her only way forward, she couldn't run from this problem, nor was she going to. I am coming Issei, I will earn forgiveness. She whispered as her feet began to feel wet. She looked down and saw what looked like a liquid of some kind, but couldn't see it clearly as the cave was rather dark. She summoned a small ball of fire as a light source, only to see she was walking in a pool of blood. She was frozen in place, how couldn't she be? She was standing in blood and looking around her, this wasn't the only pool of it. She took a deep breath and began to walk again, walking around the many pools, which a bit after turned to lakes of it. She felt herself wanted to gag or throw up as she rotten bodies falling down from the selling and some floating up from the lakes of blood. What is this place? She wondered, as her breathing became faster thanks to her being scared and terrified of what she was seeing. She soon after, thankfully, left the blood and gore filled area behind, but instead entered something that didn't scare her as much. She found that the cave had floated part of it, which was okay, but the weird thing was that the water was black, much like the jar of oil. She put one of her feet in it and felt it to be heavy and almost hard to piece. She didn't want to, but she felt that this was only way to move further. She took of her heavy cloths, she took a few steps back as she began to run forward then jump, then sliding into the black water. She felt the heavy water surrounding her, almost squishing her with how heavy it was. She kept swimming and swimming. She felt her body and mind starting to become weaker, as she hadn't breathed for a while now. Her eyes began to give in, then her legs, arms and lastly mind. She began sinking deeper into the dark water, as she reached out with her hand, trying to grasp something or anything. Her body sank deeper, as her mind began to go blank. Issei. 
forgotten dreamscape, inside a dark void, no rather a black space of some sort, sat two figures. One was lying on the ground, its body not moving, but it was alive as far as the other figure knew. The other figure was lying on down its body, in a lying post ion much like a dog's, staring intently at the other figure. The space was quit, as only nothing and more nothing could be heard and smelled. It was broken as the lying figure began to breath loudly, then stopping soon after as it stopped breathing, feeling no need for it, and not understanding why it had done it. It then looked towards the other figure, seeing that it was many times bigger than itself, yet it did fear it. Or rather it didn't know what to do, as nothing happened in its body, mind or anything told it what to do. It was much like a blank painting, nothing about his compulty and don'ts know what it will end up being. The two figures looked at each, their black jar-like bodies with only limited definition, missing eyes to look with. Yet they could still see and hear. A smaller figure kept looking at the other figure, which in turn lowered its head towards the other ones. Its body had black liquid drip off it as it moved, but paid it no mind, as the two were now face to face. Both blank, expressionless figures kept looking at each other, both not sure on what to do next, or if there even was a next step. A smaller figure decided to stand up, the other figure following its movements, moving its head along with the other figure's head to still be at the same height. But then a bit after, felt it should stand up as well. It did so, reveling its much bigger body, to the smaller figure, whom looked on with interest or something like that. It had seemed to study its body, like it wanted to know more about it. Both figures now stood up, still having eye contact with each other. Both of their bodies began drip much more of this jar-like liquid off of them, it began to give way for new colors underneath it. Like it was only a blank hitting their real bodies underneath. The smaller figure was the first to be fully clean or revealed of its hidden self. It was a young woman, it had long red hair, with fire white skin and a pair of dull green eyes. It wore nothing other than what seemed to be a bra, panties and socks. It looked at its now revealed body, studying it as found more and more on it. It then looked back at the other figure, only to find the massive figure was gone, and left in its place was a small body. It was a boy with messy golden hair, it had almost tan-like brown skin, with a pair of dull golden eyes with a green slit going down the middle of them. It wore no shirt, only shorts and nothing else. It too was studying its body, not understanding why it was now so small and not massive like before. It too looked at the other figure, seeing a woman standing in front of it. They both looked at each other, still unsure of what to do and what they even should or could do. Their bodies had changed, along with now giving them a gender or had they always had this gender. Had just forgotten everything they had done before entering this place. The women bent down on her knees so that she and the boy could have eye contact. She didn't know why she did this or why she no felt or rather knew she was woman, as she felt only moments before that she was a blank figure or maybe even nothing. The two looked at each other, both had dull looking eyes, but they then suddenly gained life to them, rather they began to shine as they both felt something. They felt these things they had never felt before, they wanted to act on these feelings, but not sure on how the other would react or what they would even say. Could they even say anything? The boy put his hand to his face, seeching for something didn't he know was there or would have ever known was there. He found two holes going up, then stopping at a wall he couldn't get through. He then moved his hand a bit down and found two flaps under his nose. He put a few fingers inside it, finding another wall, but this time he felt he could move through it. He opened his mouth, the woman looking at what he was doing, she tried the same finding her own mouth as well. Wawiroyu? Who are you? Asked the boy, his tone sounding unsure of himself. As this was his first time speaking, as far as he knew at least. The woman looked at him, trying to think up a good answer to give him, as she had somehow understood what he had said to her. A. A don't. Noj. Who are. Juo. I don't know, who are you? She asked, she herself also felt unsure of herself as she had asked and answered the boy's cusation. The boy looked at her, unsure of how to answer as he didn't know. No he those no, he just remembered his name, or at least he thinks it's his name. I. Ajmise. I am a say he said, not sure if he said it correctly, but it was the first he had heard it. The woman eyes widen at the mention of his name, but she wasn't sure why she felt so happy, just by hearing it. Or was she happy? She didn't know, nor have time to devil on it, as she was asked another accusation by Issei. Where or why? Where are we? Asked Issei, his voice was less stoic, but more curious than previously. The woman now also began to wonder where they were, she looked around the jar black space, the floor, the walls and the selling. There was no exit, no way forward, no nothing. Just a black space with only these two as a color that contrasted the rest of the space. I. Don't know. Where do, you think we are? She asked Issei, who too looked around the space, feeling almost trapped inside the space, it felt too small for him. He just shook his head, the woman understanding it as his way of saying no. He looked into her eyes suddenly, he felt almost like he was diving into those beautiful green gems, he felt something something as he was doing this. 
He felt they reminded him of something, something he once knew or had always known. The woman too at the sudden eye contact also began to dive inside his golden eyes, not by her own will, but by a more deep-rooted will and desire to do so. She felt herself relax at their eyes contact, but few times she felt herself fear for her life and sometimes even want to jump the boy and hold him. She didn't understand why, but she felt a strong connection to him, to say. A sudden pain hit her in her brain, her mind flashed an image of her with an grimson red armored person, his face reveled. It looked much like Issei's face, but older. No, was this the real him, she wondered. Then suddenly Issei said something to her that shocked to her very core. Ria's. Is that you? Ria's eyes widened as it all came back to her, her life, her name, her family and friends. Her Issei. She stood up suddenly, backing away as she also realized that the boy before her was the new Dragonic Issei. The one she was certain would kill her for having hit his mother. But even so, her navy it still pressed her to see if this was her Issei or the boy who wanted to kill her. Yes. It's me. It's me Issei, your Rias. She spoke unsure of how he was going to react, and to her surprise, his reactions was not what she expected at all. Rias. Who is that again? Oh right, the girl who got me killed over and over and over and over again. Issei voice was cold, but it was not the only voice. No, it was mirrored by many old and dead people who have affected both of their lives. Rhea saw that jar-like figures of Raynor, Freed, Risser, Kakabriel, Kuroka, Vali, Biku, Orther, Loki, Diodora, Shalba, Kao Kao, Rizvrm, Krumkrunch, Trahiksa and even herself. She was taking aback as she slowly walked back away from all of these ghosts. What? What are you doing? Here? She asked in bewilderment. They all began to giggle, some chuggle, even laugh, Will Issei kept a stoic face. His eyes piecing her with how cold they were. It's into clear Miss Gremory. The boy has held it terribly secret all this time, and now he can finally let it out after all this time. Oh how you became a artiches is beyond me. Spoke the older figures, all while the younger just kept giggling and chuggling. Rias just became more worried, not understanding what they're saying. What do you mean? What secret? I know everything there is to know about him, he would have told if something like that was real she yelled, her tone unsure as they seemed to bask in her statement. Be a really little devil. Come now, I knew more about him after only one date than you did after sleeping in his bed for half a year. Spoke Rainer as her figure put two arms around the shoulder of Issei, holding him into her jar liquid-like form. It began to fall off her body, revealing her real self. The other figures too also regained their real apron soon after. It's not that right Issei dear, meow? Asked Kuroka as she hugged his small body from the side as the other's figures also began to close tightly around him. Get. Get away from him. Rhea spoke weakly, she felt weak in the current situation. Oh those Risser have to spell it out for you? It's rather simple, if you think about it. Risser started, but it was ended by Vali. He has always had small part of him, that hates you more than anything. Answered the other version of herself, smirking while doing saying, it almost looked she enjoyed it. No. No, that can't. Can't be right. He loves me, Issei loves me she almost cried, but she held it in for now. That was until Drake began to speak. Or sure Gremory. After all he may be stupid, but he is still smart enough to put two and two talk there. I was there with him, as he almost killed you that night. I even tried to stop him, but now I see I might have been wrong to do so. My best partner die for your selfish dreams and wants. Growled Drake behind her, she turned her head slowly to see him in his real form, glaring her down, as soon as she and him made eye contact. Drake. How are he is here because this place is one where all Issei's memories can be set free. Spoke Trahiksa as it lowered its many heads down to her level. She felt a shiver go both up and down her spine at the sudden face to faces. She looked away from the many eyes of the beast and saw Issei being covered by the many females who had all harmed him in some way. She felt the many figures eyes on her, everyone who have a hand in affecting his life as well as her own. She began walking towards Issei, slowly as she felt this would all stop if she rearched him. The many other figures let her pass, letting her see the many women who almost fully covered him in their bodies. But as she neared she saw how those bodies began to melt into the jar, covering his body. She began to run past the last reaming figures, who also began to melt away, but before his body was completed covered, she saw a glimpse of his hate-filled eyes. She stood still, frozen in place by this one glimpse. His body was covered in the black jar, but it soon began to expand into something much bigger. It began form four gained legs, as a longer body and neck was also formed. A tail also began to spread out of it. It soon began to form two longer and thinner arms out from its back, which after a bit gained a few spikes, which turned into longer and thinner spikes. Its body had become that of a dragon's, though its outwards appearance was that of a black dragon, but even that began to change as the jar fell off it. An armored body was revealed in its place, every plate of metal was gray, with red and golden lines in some places. 
Its eggs was sharp, and every claw and spike deadly to even touch. Rhea stood in fear under its monstrous presences, she felt her heart beating so fast it hurt. It shifted its burning golden eyes to her terrified green ones, she even fell on her back by pure fear of it. No of him. Issei. Was all she could utter at his new form, no longer the rather cute boy or young man, but now a monster out of a horror story. I remember everything. Everything you have done to him, to me. You. You ruined his. No my life you ruin everything you touch, but that is not the worst, you even dare to kill my mother lowly devil scum, he roared as he had circumed to his inner anger, as an outcome of granting him his memories back. Not only the all the good times come back, but also all those times that make him cusetion his friendships, his lovers and even his sanity. Rias could all crawl slowly back away from him, as she feared doing anything else would result in her death. He slammed both of his front legs into the ground, making the whole space shack from his sheer amount of strength. My whole life has been one big joke, and now I finally had a chance to have a good one, but you and everyone else just had to come along and ruin that that's all you are good for here or as his aura came out in waves, knocking her back every time the wave was strong enough. And now you even went so far as to kill my mother you heartless bitch, I see now why they call you the Prinix of Ruin, because you ruin everything here or again. Rias would have become more scared if not for something he had said. But I didn't kill her, I only knocked her out. She thought. She tried to stand up, getting knocked down a few times, but she managed to stand after a few tries. What do you plan to do now? Want to tell me another lie? Hum and try me because this will be your last one here art as he lowered his head to her height, his mouth only a meter or two away from her. She breathed in and out, trying to calm herself, as she knew if he sensed the smallest amount of fear, then he would kill her. She opened her eyes, staring into his burning golden one without flinching once. I didn't kill your mother. You may not bell of me, but I will admit that I have never once been as good of a master, friend or lover as I should have been to you. I let you take up the burden of my shortcomings, because I was never able to, at least it was what I told myself every time. She stopped, as she bowed before him, lowering herself as far down as she could. Her shame was obvious to say or anyone who could see this. I have failed over and over again, and never once did I learn my lesson. Only when you died on that day did I finally get it through my head that I was. I was not. She stopped as she felt his gaze intensified, the pure fear she felt made her unable to continue. What? You were not what? He asked in an angry tone, spring her alive again, fearful he might just kill her outright if she didn't answer. That I wasn't able to do anything, as I had never lost anything when I had lost before. When I lost you, it finally hit me. I had finally lost something, and I could never get it back. She finished, her voice began to crack as she was crying, remembering how she felt that day. Issei became shocked, he could feel how sad, shameful and lost she felt right now. He would be lying if he said that he didn't feel bad for her. He could also tell that she had been truthful for every word, making him doubt what he was doing right now. What was he doing, and why was he doing it? Rage. Was that really what led to this, was that always the one single emotion that was going to bring him to such extents? He felt his older self and his new self, both unsure of what to do, as they both wanted to hurt and yet also spare her. There was liances, as neither of them spoke. Rias was still crying into the ground, mumbling about wanting his fortiveness, even if he killed her. She didn't see his body vanishing, nor the more human body standing where he used to stand. Nor did she hear him begin to walk towards her, each footstep having a splashing noise to it, as the floor made small ripples almost like it was water. She didn't see the two feet standing right in front of her, but she did feel the sudden feeling of a hand on her head. I am sorry. I went too far. Said the voice of the younger Issei. Rhea's head slowly turned up to meet his face, where she saw his tear-stained eyes and his crying face. She was shocked, she had thought he would have killed her or at least hurt, but he looked genuinely ashamed of himself. Why? Why would he say sorry? I have been. Way, way worse than he had ever been. She thought to herself. She kept looking at his now crying face, he felt shame for how he had acted, it made her release that he was just a kid. A kid who had just been given a heavy burden once again. She sat down on her knees, feeling the less jar and more water-like floor touch more of her body. She then re-arched her hands around him and held him into her as she felt his tears stream down her chest and stomach. She held him carefully, stroking his spiky golden hair. It's okay. I should be asking for your forgiveness, you don't have to. It's okay now, I won't let anything bad happen to you again. She said quickly next to his ear, soon after feeling the tears stop and replaced with his quit breaths as she felt his body had fallen asleep. Never expected to see you lower yourself that far, just for my forgiveness. You have changed Rias. Said a sudden voice, Rias looked towards it only to find a young adult man. He had spiky brown hair, golden eyes, a small beard, a few scars, and rather castler cloths on. Who are you? Another one of those freaks here to ruin his life. She asked with tone that promised he would have to go through her if he wanted to make trouble. 
Oh heavens no, geez prez can't even remember your nr.1 pawn. He asked with a more cheerful tone, making Ria's eyes widen at what he had just said. Yo prez how have you been? Issei asked, his figure and outward appearance looking like his father's in some way. Ria's released that this what he would probably have looked like if had lived to this day. Unlike the others, his life force was back to that of humans, so age progression was rather normal for him again. Ria's eyes couldn't widen more, even if they wanted, which they did at the sight of him. The real him. Issei. Was all she could say, as she slowly reached an arm out to him. He took it in his own. Yes Ria's. He asked with a smile she would never forget. Chapter 13. Forgotten kiss. Forgotten dreamscape. What's wrong Ria's? Aren't you happy to see me? Asked Issei, as his smile became even more friendly and as Ria's eyes began to form tears. She reached her other hand out to his face, holding it in one hand, looking into his eyes. He held her other hand, leaning a bit into it as his smile became much more relaxed, as a few tears began forming in his own eyes. Hey what's wrong Ria's, don't cry or I'll cry too. He said, making Ria's giggle a little at how he had barely changed over the many years. It's really you, isn't it? My Issei. She spoke with the most beautiful smile Issei had ever seen. He had missed this, these moments where her most beautiful smiles would appear, where she'd be herself only for him to see. Yes, it's me Ria's. It's me Issei, you're Issei. He smiled as he said that last part, in turn making Ria's no longer hold back her tears, as they began to roll down her beautiful face. In a single moment Ria's moved herself forward and kissed Issei for the first time in over a decade. No longer was just in her dreams, the fake and fantasy tempered kisses, but a real one. This was real right, it had to be. Issei kissed her back seconds after, holding her lovingly into him, still holding on to her even when they both pulled away. Ria's and Issei both looked at each other, breathing heavily at their rather long kiss, but it was worth it as they hadn't felt each in that way for many, many years. Ria's, you wouldn't bell of how much I have missed you. Being trapped like this for so many years, never being able to see you or my family, it was so painful to just sit and wait for that one chance. As Issei said that, Ria's felt a slight pain over something she knew that she had tell him, but didn't know how to. I know Issei, but knows all over and we can be together again, you can live with me and the others in the underworld. You can become my my husband after all this time. Ria said, as a slight blush appeared on her cheeks, the same went for Issei at the mention of become married to Ria's. But his eyes as soon as the shined with happiness, they became unhappy and dull, as a small tear rolled down his cheek. What's wrong? Aren't you happy that we can finally be together? Asked Ria's, not aware that the younger Issei was looking at them, his eyes holding a small amount sadness, as he knew that what she wished for could not happen. I can't be your husband, Ria's. Issei answered, his smile gone, and his happy eyes having turned to sad ones. Ria's was confused about what he was saying. Why can't he? I thought that once this was over, me, Issei and the younger Issei. Oh. It's only me and kid Issei who gets to leave, isn't it? She thought as she looked at Issei with also a sad look in her eyes, as she just sank into Issei, who held her as she began to sob. Why why can't I be with with you? You're the only only thing I want. So why Issei? Why? cried Ria's, as she held onto his body with every muscle in her body, worried he might be gone if she let go of him. Ria's. There is no no easy way to say this, but I am not safe to be around, not after all this time inside of here. So once I am done here, I will leave for a perfect dream as my resting place. Issei explained as he began to pat her on the back, putting his other hand on the back of her head, feeling her slicky soft grimson red hair. Ria's just kept sobbing as his words sank in, she wanted him to come with her, she wanted him to come back to her and live with him. She wanted to do so many things with him, tell him so many things with him. Isn't there any way to get you back back to me? She asked in between her sobs and quieted cries, which became a bit louder at the heavy sigh released from his same mouth. There isn't anything you can do, I made my choice, and that's all there is to it. He explained as he lowered his head onto her own, resting it on top of hers. They stood like that for seconds, minutes, maybe even an hour, they didn't know nor did they care. This was the last time they would see each other, so they had to get as much out of this limit time as they could. The younger Issei still watched as they kept hugging, feeling sorry for both of them, and also real life of the older version of him, as he could finally end his long and not really pleasant afterlife inside of his head. He decided to look at the place they were at, seeing it was a beach, something his mother had told him about. The place with sand, a duster stone that had been smashed so many times, it became almost soft to touch. And with huge lake next to it, which connects to other beaches, and also home to some dumb dragon king named Midgardserman. But thanks to the many lock and chains of his past life's memory he had unlocked and broken, he knew this place was rather special to his past self, and Ria's, so intern it was probably also important to him now. Or should it be? He had not really thought about it before, but all those women and people he saw outside of his mother's cave, they were not there for him, they were there for his past self. 
so what do they want from him? He isn't his past self, even with all his memories, powers, strengths and such he is still just a Saitai Madison, not a Say Haidu. He hadn't noticed that he had subconsciously turned into his dragon form, but when he did he didn't care too much and instead decided to go out into the ocean. He felt the refreshingly cold water hit his scales and the sand under its surface give in under his weight for every step he took. Until he was a few meters away from the shore, he decided to sit down, making massive waves around him. He began to think again what he should do once they left this place, should he stay with his mother or should he learn more of his past life. That's when it hit him, he had wanted to become Kaneko's familiar. Why did I want to do that again? She almost killed me, but then again she also lead me to meet all these people. What should I do he mentally screamed at his own problems, he got it was due for those two and all the other people to lose a say, but what about him? How will they see him, and what will they see him as? Will he become I see Haidu, or will he stay a say? He didn't mind too much becoming a say Haidu, but at the same time wouldn't it mean he would give up himself to play the part of someone who will be gone and dead by then? If he stayed himself would those people still care, or would they just leave him alone and see this whole day as a waste of time, would they maybe even hate him for giving them hope? These were all unfair things to put on the shoulders of child hatchling, he don't even know what is his or his past lives anymore, it all seems so mixed and connected now. Like he was just a blank painting that got a few colors on it for Pratis, and now someone had just begun painting the real painting over the former one. His mind was going into overdrive, as fear, terror, dread and despair began to seep in. Was he going to die and let his past self take his place? His body began to scream in pain as he began to turn and roll around in the water, as the pain was becoming too much for him. His mind was no longer his, his body was both his and not his. Everything was slipped in two, and he only got the weaker half. He couldn't hear the worried voice of Rias yelling out to him, trying to calm him down with magic or just by touching him in a caring way. He let out a roar of pain as the sound of his screaming was replaced instead with green, then blue, then grimson red, and then finally golden flames. His mind was blank, his body was not his. He was nothing, just a small part of the bigger picture inside this body that once was his. Isay Isay can you hear me Isay screamed Rias as she frantically looked over part of Isay body, as it was lying so utterly still in the water, not moving a single inch, not even breathing. She was shaking him for any kind of reaction, but nothing. She stood there in dead silence as the waves hit his dead still body over and over again, like nothing was wrong. She then felt a hand on her shoulder, and when she turned to see who it was, she found no one there. It's now up to you, just do as I told you Rias and all will be as it was meant to be. She turned around again, looking frantically for the source of the voice. But when she looked back at Issei's body, it now had a chain over it and two locks. One lock was brown, with a grimson heart on it, it also had a key hanging off it by a chain. The other was golden, with broken grimson heart, it too had a key hanging off it. Rias didn't what to make of this, until it hit her like a reusable plot drive in a romance story. She had choice to make, a choice of which Issei she wanted to free. Well that was easy she thought, but no it wasn't. As she reached out for Borm Lock's key, she saw images of Akita Say crying, hurt and in chains, as she and her Issei were together having fun and being lovers again. It made her cry. It made her sick that she could almost make such a choice without thinking about the possible outcome. But she wanted that, she wanted her Issei, but the images came again. But this time there were worse, it was Issei being angry with her. Tiamate setting flame to the underworld in the grief of losing her son, and every other dragon helping their dragon king to grief. It also showed her friends being disappointed with her. I want him. But Issei danced want me to make him come back. He wants his peace. He. She giggled quickly at first, holding a hand to her head. It then turned to sobs. Make the right choice and take him home to see his mom. Rias turned her head at the all too familiar dragonic voice of Drake. She stared in awe as he was standing there in his full glory, looking at the hatchling Issei with pride and sorrow. I believe he wants to finally have his peace, he has expressing more things than any normal supernatural being ever has in less than two years. He deserves his peace, and the Hatchlander serves the change to live his own life. Spoke Drag as he seemed to give Rhea something that looked like a smile. How? How are you here? I thought you were still asleep. And that new host of yours? Asked Rhea's with a shocked voice. Drag roared into a laugh as he lowered his head to be near her eye contact. Do you really think I couldn't away inside of here if I didn't try hard enough? A sleeper work, I can do anything. For I am the heavenly dragon of domination, Drag haha his laugher almost began to create crazily huge waves. Rias just stood there in shock that he only just came, as it meant he had just missed to say. You know he is already gone, he is already waiting for Great Red to take him to his own heaven I know Grimory, I knew all along that he would never become the real possers of his recarnated body, but only a part of it, and I am happy he finally got to find peace, so don't drag back into this crazy yet still beautiful world of ours. 
let yourself free of him and find someone new, it's the only chain holding him back. Ria's look stunned at Drake's words as she looked back to Issei's body. The golden lock, it had to be the right one and she was going to find out. Click. Chapter 14. Issei. Familiar forest, outside teammate's cave. The wall of smoke, sand and dust was still up, swirling around a bit in there as nothing really seemed to happen much but it had begun to seem weaker in terms of mass and how tight the cloud had been earlier, something which Great Red and Office both noticed but still chose to stand still and observe. It had been like this for a few hours now. Lilith had given up watching and had started playing with Asia, who was only really doing since it meant she wouldn't have to think or focus too much on everything that had happened so far. She was tired, every one of the girls that had talked with him was. Serzich's, Grafie and Team Volley was all cut up to what had happened from the perstices of the four girls who had all been in the cave with him. While that had been going on Neen, Kaneko Queen, had been taking care of Tiamate as she was still unconscious after taking that hit from Rias. She had begun to stabilize, as her breathing had become more relaxed, but her worry and fear was still there and could be felt if he was too close. Which Neen was, which made it hard for her to help her, even more so since she was Nekamata, meaning she can feel those kinds of emotions much better than others. So let me get this straight, you all met him inside of Issei's mind. Asked Biku as he sat with a confused look on his face, all of the girls nodding, expect Asia she was too busy playing with Lilith. Huh. Weird, I though he was like already aware of his own memories, not that he was living inside of someone else's as those words left his mouth, he had a sword to his neck, the sword belonging to Zenobia, as she held an angry expression on her face. Biku held his hands up in peace, watching as the other two girls had angry face. He decided that living up to his legacy was the best way forward and asked. I am wrong on that part. All of the girls nodded their heads as Zenovia lowered her sword slowly. Issei is Issei, that Issei who owns the body is just A. Zenovia stopped herself as something clicked in her head, a puzzle piece she hadn't put in place, yet had just been placed, and she just thought about she had just said. Tears began rolling down her checks as her own words began to sink in. The two other girls looked at her worriedly as they had never seen her have breakdown like since Issei died. Akone and Kaneko put a hand on each of shoulders, trying to comfort her a little. Biku just looked at her shocked and silkly confused, then he realized that he might have done this. I I am sorry, I didn't mean to. He was stopped as Zenobia shot up a hand telling him to stop, making him feel like he screwed up even more. You're right, he is just a memory inside someone else's body. Her voice sounded almost deafened as she said this. The two other girls looked at her confused as to why she would something like that, it didn't make sense. Biku just looked to his side, where Vali and Author, and hoped one of those two would help him out with this. Neither of them did, instead Serzich's came to the rescue. He stood up and walked over next to Zenovia. So, you realize that the Issei you have been seeing inside of the new Issei's mind is no more than a spirit trapped inside a new body. He isn't the one you have all been helping by unlocking those chains and locks you talked about, you help that hatchling. Spoke Serzich's, his word sounded so true, as if he had known all along, but really he had just put the piece together in his mind. Everyone who was listening in now put their full attention on Serzich's as he began to explain his theory or almost fact. If you notice that the story you have all told that Issei never once began to talk to you like he once did. Instead he talk as if he knew you, but from another perspective, not like he was in friend or person that you've known for years. If anything, you may have all told yourself that he was slowly becoming the old Issei, but I don't think he ever was, he was just gaining knowledge of things he had never known before. Explained Serzich's, the people all listening to him shock at his theory, but could hear the reasoning in it. It made sense. The Cone, Kaneko and Zenovia all froze as he said that. They all three began to think to back to what they had seen, remembering their conversations with him. Serzich's was right, he didn't seem or act like he was becoming Issei, but rather just gaining information and insight into things Issei had done and knew. They all looked at each other, their eyes wide as they realized how stupid they had been. Did. I really fool myself to bell of that if he regained more of. Issei memory that he would then become Issei. Was all Zenovia could say as she looked defeated down at the ground. The two others looked like they were in the same state as her, as none of them knew how to react after having this harsh reality hit them. This was something Serzich's and mostly everyone else outside of the Rias peerage knew about them, that they had never really lost anything completed, and if they did, they would always gaining it back or something like it. The first loss they had ever really felt was the loss of Issei, and now that a chance to get him back appeared their brain must have made them believe that they could return to how things used to be. I am sorry, but this isn't a fairy tale where the hero dies and then comes back later on. Was all Serzich's said as he stood up and walked away from the group and over to Tiamate. The three girls didn't notice this or just didn't care as they all felt unsure of what to do. Should they bell of him or should they wait and see if they might have been right? But while they were thinking about these things, something else also hit them. Asia. 
How is she taking this? Wouldn't she be the most affected by these words? They all in sync turned towards her. She was crying, a lot too. Lilith was trying to comfort her, patting her on the shoulder lightly. Big sis why are you crying? Was it because of what the devil said? Asked Lilith so unaware of the emotion that the sweet little Asia was going through. She sniffled rather loudly as she tried to hold back her tears a bit. She looked up to Lilith, making the little goddess have a surprised face, which was shared by the others who saw Asia face. She wasn't crying because she was sad. She wasn't crying because she wouldn't get a say back. She was crying because she was happy. It could be seen as clearly as day by her kind and brilliant smile. I am okay. I am relieved that Isaiah Isaiah danced have to return to life. He has always suffered so much much for me. And everyone else I couldn't bear to see him go through such things again. She croc as her voice had become rather rough and her tears had broken through ruining her cloths as they became wet with her almost godly amounts of tears. Lilith looked happy as her big sis wasn't sad, but everyone else who had heard were quit shock. They had old Belle if she would have been the one who would have wanted him back the most, but rather she was the one who wanted him to find peace the most. The cone looked at Asia with confusion in her eyes. She didn't understand how she of all people would want him to not return. She needed him as much as they all needed him, without him they aren't whole. Without him they aren't able to do anything. It hit her as she began to remember all the times Issei came to their rescue, all the times he saved them and gave his own life for them. She nor any of the others besides Asia had noticed the amount of pain he had gone through for them. Every new changeling they were met with, he would always spearhead for them as they were never strong enough to do so themselves, and he would always return hurt more than them. It broke a cone to think that it took so long to finally notice this one obvious fact. And it broke her even more inside to think she wanted him to return this kind of life where they would offer him their love and he would offer them his life. How could they ever repay him for all that he had done for them? How could they ever repay him for the lost limbs, battle scars, trauma and loss he had faced for them? She felt terrible for having never seen this and for thinking all he needed was her love for him to continue doing this for her and everyone else. As the younger people began to try and comfort the four girls, Grafia and Serzichas stood with Neen watching Tiamate carefully. They had hoped she would have woken up a few hours ago, but she was still out cold. I am sorry my king, but I bell of Lady Rhea's maid have hit her with all she had. We should send her to a hestipital or at least ask for a person who knows better healing magic than Lady Asia. Said Neen at the arrival of Serzichas and Grafia. It's fine, but I agree. It makes me both proud and sad that Rias could achieve something like this. Puh. This day is really getting to me, all this new information, discoveries and power scaling. I should take a before Serzichas could finish that last bit, a deep growl was heard from Tiamate as she seemed to stir awake slowly. Neen eyes went wide as she hadn't thought she would have woken up so soon. Serzichas and Grafia were almost as surprised, but then again they met Issei and seen his incredible feats of recovery, so this was almost normal to them. Lady Tiamate, let me help you. Neen quickly recompassed herself and tried to help Tiamate off the ground, but Tiamate just shrugged her off, almost pushing her over with the amount of strength she used. She turned over, making her stand on all four. Her long blue hair was covering most of her body, even lying on the ground with how long it was. Then in mere second her angry shot out, making large angry wave go out from around her. The wave wasn't strong, but it did push most of the people who weren't prepared for it over. Serzichas and Grafia had taken the hit and still stood nearby. Serzichas tried to walk closer to hopefully calm her, but when he went closer, Vali suddenly summons his wings, and Albion yelled out. Serzichas be careful, Tiamate is most likely in a state of disorientation. She could possible attack if you're not careful. Yelled Albion out, making Serzichas stop in his tracks, as he was not one to doubt a dragon's judgment regarding another dragon. So he stood still and waited for when Tiamate would speak or something of the like. But she did, as she began to glow in a bright blue color. It began to exponent size, making Neen, Serzichas and Grafia need to step away from her. The glow disappeared a bit after, and what was left was Tiamate in her true form, a gink blue western dragon. Serzichas didn't know if he should speak now or wait a bit more, but he was beat to it by Albion. Tiamate, take it easy you have been knocked for a few hours now. It's me Albion I know it's you Albion, now shut it Tiamate yelled back at the two sliver and blue wings on volley back, which had a kind of scared sound come from them. The mate looked around for a bit, scanning the area for something or rather someone. Then she shifted her gaze to Serzich's, then turned towards him fully and even lower her head, but only enough so that Serzich would still have to look up to have eye contact. Her chaotic eye colors glared at Serzich's blue ones, as Tiamate was clearly angry about many things, but one mostly. And that one happened to be related to Serzich's. Where is she, devil? Her growling voice was laced with anger and wrath. Serzich's gained a familiar aura around him, as Tiamate had just threatened him. What will you do if you find her, Tiamate? Serzichas had thrown Logi out the window and went on defensive. 
As many of the devil higher-ups know, Serzichas and Seraphil are most dangerous when one threatens their little sisters. Grafia was luckily there to save most of the nearby people lives. She is with Issei, Tiamate. She spoke up, earning a shocked face from Serzichas and an even angry aura around Tiamate. She is what? Where is my son Tiamate roared out as she slammed her front legs into the ground, making many of the nearby people and trees fall down on the ground. Cracks appeared underneath Tiamate as her rising anger began to affect the space around her, and also enough for the two dragon gods to turn their attention towards the other people, instead of the wall of dust and smoke. Grafia and Serzichas were still standing, as the others had fallen on their backs. Please calm down Tiamate, your son is alright. It's Rias who is in danger. Grafia spoke as the small fear inside of Grafia had been let out, but still not enough to make her waver. Tiamate looked at her carefully, scanning her face features to see if there was any desite. Tiamate let out a low growl as she raised her neck high again and began to look around the area. Her eyes widened when she noticed that her mansion was no more than rubble and dust. Tiamate's upper body began rise as she was about to slam the ground again, as any dragon would when the home has been destroyed, but Great Red spoke up before she could perform more damage to the area. Calm down teammate don't take this out on the devils, it's your hatchling faults, he destroyed your cave roared Great Red as he calmly walked over to her. The mate stood back down on the ground with all four legs, making the earth shake a bit. What? How is that even possible, my red gem? He is powerful. But I didn't expect him to be able to do something like this what happened to him Great Red. The mate asked with shock and worry in her voice, Great Red noticed this and overlooked her lack of respect when saying his name, but it was fine if it just happened once. I believe he thought you had been killed or at least very hurt by the red-haired devil girl. Answered Great Red as he reached Grafia and Serzichas, standing along with them in a line in front of Tiamate. Tiamate looked at him shocked, her anger slightly rised, only to cool a bit again. She began to walk closer to the wall of smoke and dust as she could feel his presence inside of it, or rather that he was the one who made this wall. Everyone followed her movement with a careful gaze, Great Red followed after her still no worry shown on his face. Afa stood at the front of the wall and looked at Tiamate as she reached the wall, standing in front of it and waiting. Great Red walked up besides her and stood still then after. All three of them looked and waited for those to return. Inside the forgotten dreamscape, Issei Issei wake up dot dot I am sorry. I am sorry, that almost choose my Issei over. Over you. Rias cried out as she held the small and young body of Issei in her arms. His tanned skin had become pale as if he was sick. His hair had lost its color and become white, much like one with stress would. But the worst was his breathing, or rather lack of. He hadn't been breathing for God only knows how long, and Rias felt so much unbearable shame as she felt it was her fault. It was her fault. It was always her fault that Issei got hurt. Her face was stained with tears that had made lines that were clear enough to see multiple different streams of tears. Her hair was a mess and had become stuck on her wet cheeks. She didn't know what to do or how to get out of this place. Issei. You should never have met me. You should never have she stopped herself as she felt shame clawed her again, but this time for her not being smarter and a better person, as she had promised to say. She hugged his cold and lifeless body tightly into her, before standing up and carrying him in her arms. She had to try. Try harder than ever before, that would be the only way to get out of here and to honor her promise to him. But first she had to make a plan or something, or else she would be just running like headless chicken. She began to sense for any teleportion magic, space isle magic or maybe even transporting sacred-like power. Every second that went she only found more and more of the plain normal magic, nothing about this was in its own plane. It was almost like they were just transported to another place. A forgotten dream. It hit her as she thought up this theory of hers, she looked at the sky, reganixing it as the sky of the underworld, with its different colored sun and purple sky. Had they really just been in the underworld this whole time? Then how hadn't Rias not noticed that they were earlier? And if they were, then how come Issei could have been here, as well as Dreg? Rias couldn't think straight with all these different thoughts, theories and ideas. How did I never notice this? How did we get here from the familiar forest? Those Issei have teleportion magic. Rias wondered. Though this also made it a bit easier to get Issei somewhere he could heal. Rias just remembered that his time was short and she wasting time still sitting here, then preparing a teleportion circle. She began to it with the coordinates of Grimory territory, namely the medical wing that Asia was in charge of. All the other thoughts was put away for the time being, as they would not help her save Issei, nor would they do anything other than course her more doubt. She almost stopped preparing the circle when she was surprised by the sound of breathing. She looked down to her left arm to see Issei's chest rising and lowering slowly, she could even make the faint noise of his weakened breathing. She couldn't stop herself from smiling and crying at the same time. She finished the teleportion circle, hoping that they would end up in the Gremory territory or somewhere she knew, as normally when you teleport, you have to know the coordinates of from your teleporting from and to. 
She stepped onto the circle with a say in her arms, finally breathing slightly. She activated the circle, praying to the dead mass this would work. The circle began to go up, as Grimson Light began to consume both Rias and Issei. She looked at Issei while this happened, hoping she was holding him in a way that was comfortable, or at least would help him breath normally. She looked up and out to the beach they had been on, then island they had been on. She was probable never going to see this place ever again, but at least she got be here one last time with Issei, even if he was just ghost. The circle disappeared, along with the two on it. Time skip, underworld Grimmery territory, under the orange sun's light, in the middle of Gaint Garden stretching out for a few kilometers, light a Gaint Blue Western Dragonus. She was Socian so that she would have a view both of the sky and garden on her's left and inside a room in the Gaint Garden mansion that the Grimmeries owned. She had been there for a week now, just lying there and keeping an eye on the room on her right. She had barely eaten all the time she had been there, but she didn't show. Not as much as her eyes which were stained by tears, from her almost sleepless nights where she almost has to cry herself to sleep. Inside the room lied a young boy, with tan skin and blondish hair. He was sleeping peacefully, at least it was how it looked on the outside to anyone not in the know. The truth was he had been in this state since he was brought here a little over a week ago. He had been sleeping ever since the owner of mansion he was in had brought him here. But why would Lady Rias bring some random boy? And why is the great lady teammate here as well? Do you know anything Grafia? Asked one of the maids who had been taking care of the boy today. Grafia stopped up as her name had been called and looked over to the group of maids that all stood and gossiped about the strange gooses. She entered their little circle, which made a few of them stiffen up a bit, mostly because she was the headmaid of the Grimmery family and wife of Sirzich's Lucifer. The boy's name is Issei, and he is teammate Hatchling, or what we would call child. They are staying here because Lady Rias has a special adamant to Issei. Grafia explained to the other maids, who all nodded and giggled. Oh the Duchess is taking care of such a cute boy, maybe she wants a child. Said one maid. Maybe she does, wouldn't it be great to take of another Grimmery child. Milikas was so cute when he was still young. Said another maid, as the other four maids and Grafia agreed. Maybe she owed teammate a fever, and she offered to help when her son became sick. Said a third maid, thus also making Grafia leave the gossip circle, as she knew that they would run wild with gossip if she said something again. Grafia walked down the hallway towards the garden doors. She turned another corner, then a few steps later reached the door and went outside. She took in the fresh fragrance of the many flowers and plants in the garden, before turning towards Tiamate and walking over to an outdoors table and chair that she had placed there, as she and Tiamate had talked a lot the last few nights. She reached the table, but before she sat down in the nicely metal-crafted chair, she bowed to Tiamate. Good afternoon Tiamate, has your day been well? Tiamate looked over to Grafia, her few sources of comfort in her current state. Good afternoon to you as well Grafia. It has been like all others before it, empty without my red gem in it to brighten my day. She spoke with slightly happier tone than the nights before, which was something that made Grafia feel less worried about her well-being. That's good to hear. Have you tried to walk around the garden yet? It's quite nice this time of year. Suggested Grafia, hoping she could maybe have Tiamate begin to do something to keep her mind off the many thoughts she had throughout the day. It was important that she herself didn't also need to be put in a bed because of health problems or worst of all dragons fall. Grafia didn't if Tiam could get a rare and dangerous disease from this, but why risk it? I did, for just a little bit. Ria's has a beautiful garden, it might even have more color in it than my eyes. The maid answered with a more relaxed tone, as she couldn't help but feel much more at peace with Grafia around. Maybe it was because Grafia could relate as fellow mother, but then Vanalina would also have been able to, or maybe it was because she had been in some familiar situation with her own son after the fight with Trahixa. Whatever the reason was didn't really matter, all that matter was that she didn't have to feel alone in this. Not that she was, as Rias and the other girls would visit at least once a day. She even got to meet the peerage Issei Haidu had been a part of. They had all said things like how he looked so much like the old Issei, something she didn't want to hear, as it made her feel things she still hadn't been able to fully understand. But she knew that these feelings were feelings of fear. Fear of being forgotten by her most precise red gem. Really? I didn't we had that many colors. Maybe I should try and get this place a different name. Maybe something like, even more colorful than Tiamate's eyes. How those that sound? Asked Grafia as she was trying to show off her humor, or lack thereof. Serzich's had at one point tried to slip in a law to keep her from making these kinds of jokes. But it seemed to work on Tiamate, as Grafia earned a light heart chuggle from the Dragonus. It sounds like you're trying to show off. What if some poor devil kid goes to find out himself? She asked, in a bit of mischievous tone. Grafia giggled as well, as she had come to learn that Tiamate's jokes compared to her own ones were always a bit more deadly so to speak. That would cause a problem. Yeah maybe not the most best name for a garden anyways. Do you have one, oh merciful dragon king time 8. 
joked Grafia back as she put a hand on her mouth to hide her chuggle from her second bad joke tonight. I am turned her head towards the garden, looking over it with a peaceful gaze. She then turned her gaze back on Grafia. Aotically colorful. That way it would still be Changel to my eyes and no one has to go on quest and find out. Time 8 asked in happy manner as she put her head back in the place it had lied before, giving her full V with a say again. Grafia noticed this, it made her happy smile turned into a sad one, as it reminded her all she could really do for her friend was this. Talking and joking a bit every night. It was nice and it seemed to keep minds off of things, but she would always return to this post ion, and it made Grafia feel bad for her every time she did. I am sure he will wake up soon. If he really is like the old one, then he will wake up. Grafia said with a tone that sounded deep-minded, which made Tiamate looked over at her, slightly surprised at her tone. It made her eyes tear up a bit as she saw this person who she had been known for more than a week and a few days, saying such things and trying to help her. She looked back to say. I hope you are right Grafia, I really hope you are. Thank you. I'm Skip. A week more had gone by and Issei still in a coma, or at least that was what they told other people who had asked about it. Nor did they say his name, but just referred to him as Tiamate's son. As Serzichas didn't want the information of Issei possible being alive to reach the ears of the old devil council, as even he didn't know what they would do to keep their current power. As was a terrible and awful truth to the most of devil nobles that had met Issei Haidu, they all knew he was a major key in the amount of power the mass had back then. But when he died, the old devil council didn't waste any time to make people forget about him and change the name of one into the name of many. They gave easily controlled and weak nobles the credit for his smaller feats, while they gave bigger and more important nobles the credit for his much greater ones. All while calming that the Grimmeries had made up this assay figure to strengthen the mass and to sway public opinion. Which had woken frighteningly well, as after five or so years most of the common population had forgotten about him or thought of him as folktale. But he had been very real and was alive in the underworld, being taken care of by the household of Grimmery. But at the moment, he was in a deep sleeper coma, making the lives of a few spectic people very hard. One of which was the owner and ruler of the territory he was in, Rhea's Gremory. She was sitting in a small and rather simple chair, wearing a grimson red Victorian dress and holding a few papers up to her eyes. She was doing a bit of paperwork, but not in her office, but in the room Issei was in. He was sleeping almost silently next to her. She could almost hear the wind outside or even teammates' eyes opening and closing more loudly than his breathing, which often made her quit, worried if he was breathing or not. She came by like this a few times, just sitting by his bed and looking after him while doing some easier paperwork in the meantime. She sighed as she put down the last bits of work for day down on the small bedside table. She looked over his say, watching his cute face as he seemed so at peace while everyone around him were not. You really are a troublemaker, even after you get reincarnated. What am I to do with you? She asked out into the room, receiving no answer other than slightly louder breathing of Issei. She giggled lightly as she then reached a hand out to struck his hair, which had finally regained its nice blonde color instead of the former weaker blondish color it had. I never thought you could look so good with blonde hair. Or maybe you just look good with since you're a child. Rhea said to no one specific. She looked out of the room and instead of seeing a sun hanging high, she instead saw a sun being blocked by the sleeping head of Tiamate. She was happy that Tiamate had finally begun sleeping more than before, but she could still sleep in a more preferable way, but that was Rhea's own personal opinion. She looked back to Issei, feeling a bit remorseful at a sudden thought that struck her. I have hit a woman who you saw as your mother twice now by the old Lucifer, what kind of woman am I? Rhea's asked out loud as she put one hand over her eyes, trying to block a few small tears that had formed at that memory. Luckily before she could sink too deeply into that dark corner of her brain, she heard a knock, it came from the door. She sighed, then post ions herself to look more prober. Come in. As the words left her mouth, the door opened and in came two women. It was Grafia and Tiamate, whom had changed into her human form after have woken up. Ah, Grafia and Tiamate Sama, what can I do for you? Asked Rias as she felt a bit more relaxed. Grafia giggled just a little bit, which made Rias confused. Lady Tiamate it seems we have entered Douchus Rias' office room, I apologize for this incovenous. Grafia bowed to Tiamate, whom also began to giggle slightly. Rias was still confused until she realized what Grafia meant, she looked down and noticed the small table in front of her with paperwork and letters. She blushed slightly as she also realized she had answered as she would if anyone was to enter her workroom. She had subconsciously made Issei hospital room into her second office room. The two older ladies began to giggle a bit louder at the now obviously embarrassed Rias' expense, whom hid her face behind her hands. Don't laugh she cried out as she was still embarrassed by how easily she had let this room become a second office room. Okay, we'll stop for now, my lady. Said Grafia as she still giggled a little bit, Tiamate had thankfully stopped giggling and instead held a kind motherly smile as she looked at her hatchling. 
She walked over to his side, taking one of the other chairs in the room and then holding one of his hands in her own. Has anything changed today? She asked in relaxed tone, quit unlike her tone the days before, as she was also so worried. But it seemed becoming friends with Grafia had helped her a lot, even if it meant they would make fun of Rias together, which as shown earlier was not too hard to do. No, nothing major has changed. But his breathing has become slightly louder over the past hour or two. Rias said with a happy tone, as even though it didn't seem like much, it still meant that he was getting better. Really? I am so glad. My little red gem. She held his hand up to her head, putting the back of it to her forehead, while hold his hand with both of her own. Moth mother. A weak and rough voice was heard in the room, making all three of the women look towards the only possible source. Issei's face seemed to move around a bit, more specifically his mouth, like he was trying to speak. The inmate held onto his hand with one hand and put the other on his cheek, caressing it lovingly as another mother would. Yes, mother is right here Issei. I am right here. She said as small tears began to form. The two other didn't know what to do and so chose to observe for now until something else happened. It was hard for Rias as she wanted to hold him too but felt it would maybe ruin this little miracle. Issei didn't say anything else that day but he slept with a small smile on his face after Tiamate had held him. The inmate didn't leave the room when Rias and Grafia did as she wanted to stay by his side, if anything else were to happen, then she wanted to be there as the first. She was awake the whole night, hoping he would call out to her again. Forgotten dreamscape, two weeks ago, in a fairly nice park, with nicely trimmed bush walls and a quid-wide fountain, sat a brown-haired young man on a nearby bench. He was smiling solemnly as he was looking over the entire park, his eyes spotted many different and pretty flowers and plants. But they stopped when he noticed a red-haired man standing to his side. He was looking at the fountain with a bored look as he was standing up against a street light pole. The younger man just closed his eyes as he turned his head back towards the fountain as well, before smiling with a bit more happiness. So I guess Rias and Issei found their way back. Asked a red-haired man as the other one laughed slightly, making the other one look at him confused. What's so funny, Issei? He asked, which only resulted in Issei laughing even harder than before. When he finally stopped he held his hands up a peaceful manner. Oh I am sorry Great Red, it's just that's it's funny to hear my name being used for someone else with same name as me. It's just kind of weird in some way you know. Issei asked as his all too iconic smile took forefront. Great Red just sighed as he couldn't relate as no one would try to use his name. I don't get it, but I guess it makes sense. He answered earning another light chuggle from Issei. They then both just stood there watching the fountain before Great Red turned to Issei again. So is Trahiksa really dead this time? He asked, making Issei feel a bit stunted how he had figured it out, then relaxed as he knew it didn't really matter anymore. Yeah, he is dead for good. Besides he never wanted to be a part of that whole thing to begin with, he just wanted to be free. Issei told the now, once again and also now official, strongest being in the supernatural world. Great Red smirked as his pride had been fixed, plus it felt nice to no longer know that someone stronger than him was alive. Good. Then I guess the only thing left is to give you your peaceful internal dream inside my very being. Great Red spoke as he moved to a bit more open space. He began to use some form of magic Issei had never seen before and opened this weirdly comforting rift in space. So will that be my home from now on? It looks so bright. Issei comment before he stood up from the bench and walked over to the rift. Yes, it will make you see and only feel what you treasures the most in your life, for as long as I live that is. Great Red explained as they both turned towards each other. Issei reached a hand out to the dragon god, who looked at it for a bit, before he reached his own hand out to it. Thank you for doing this for me, it must have been any owning to do all this just for one person. Issei said, as they both shock at each other's hand. Haha, you think this was hard, try living with Office and Lilith, and having to act like a dad to someone else's child. Now that is hard but it is fun. Great Red said, as they both let go of each other's hand. Issei turned toward the rift. He could feel his legs shaking violently as he didn't really want to leave this place, but he knew he had to or else he would only suffer more for it. He took his first step inside it, then his next, until he now stood inside it fully. His mind began to feel clouded as he saw, heard and felt so many things all of a sudden. Then he saw it, a door at the end of an all too familiar hallway. He began to run at full speed towards it, opening it up with his full strength and seeing the thing he had missed the most waiting for him inside. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day. Bye.